is a start in the right direction. Well, let's get on with our service today. We have in front of us Joshua installed as a leader. You got your Bible ready? Oh, God. Is that under Andy Butterfield calling me? Is it? <laughs> Oh, where's Tim Owen? Tim, you owe us all a pizza at the church. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Hello? Who am I talking to? Me. Oh, no, no. What? The Lord God Almighty? Yeah. I got a bridge I'll sell you too. It's over the blue water river. What? This is you? The Lord God Almighty? No, no, just a minute now. What? You want to share a vision with me? A vision? Wait, just a minute. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Well, I, I know these guys that have visions. They're sitting on the street corner selling pencils. They come to my door trying to tell me that they have a vision they own my car. <laughs> or my house. <coughs> oh. Moses is dead. Well, I'd say it's about time. <laughs> the body? They have, nobody knows where that is, huh? I don't know. Okay. But now hold it just a minute. Moses was going to go into the promised land. Remember how he talked about that all the time? Oh, that land full of milk and honey, that land with vineyards and grapevines, and horses and cows and goats. Oh, no wait, do you want me to do that? Who am I really talking to? The Lord God Almighty? Uh, okay, all right. Well, the Lord God Almighty, what kind of a vision have you got? Oh, let's see. You're going to, you want me to take them across that swollen Jordan River, and you're going to give them land. All right. And then uh, every place where they set their foot, that will be their land. Every place. Houses already built, no more tent, no more manna from the ground. They'll have vineyards and orchards and goats. God help them if they have a goat. Sheep. Oh. And it'll be, they, okay, you promised this to my ancestors. And now you're going to give it to us. We've got to cross the Jordan River to get it. The swollen Jordan River. Well, I'll get the gang together and we'll talk it all over and we'll see what we can do. All right, now, nice talking to you too. Oh, you're going to be with us all the time? Yeah, I hope so because I'm scared to death. And I just don't feel like it. I'd, I'd rather I'd rather watch the tigers get beat. <laughs> but whatever. Okay, we'll get the game together. You know, I'm wondering. I see this Moses thing. These people had it pretty good. Can you hear me now? Okay, I heard my ears uh, preaching the gospel. And so I, I don't know if they can hear me or not. Okay. Now here, here's what happened. These guys had it pretty good. They were in the wilderness. The, Israel, the whole nation of Israel. Their shoes never wore out. Their clothes never wore out for 40 years. 40 years. They, their clothes never wore out. Their shoes never wore out. All they had to do was every morning go out and pick up something that looked like Wheaties off the 
ground. The whole family will all pick up enough and then fed them all day. And the next day, they, but they had it pretty good. They were sitting there. Everything was normal and good. And then along comes this troublemaker. They said, hey guys, God called us to move on to the promised land. And I want to picture in my mind, here's Joshua. His name means the Lord is salvation. And Joshua is standing there and he says to these men, he explains what God has just said to him. And then he says, I'm scared of death. I don't know where to begin. But it's not just a time of standing there, sweating and shaking, and wondering how and where. He sees the land, and he sees the river, and then he finds that God says to him, I'm going to commission you. I'm going to commission you for the work. I'm going to equip you to do the vision that I've called you to do. And so among that whole bunch of leaders, here's Joshua in the center. And he says, God says to Joshua, be strong. And what he does, he says, be strong. And then God takes his strength, his strength, and places it on Joshua. And Joshua is no longer strong in himself. He's strong in the Lord. You see, Joshua starts out like all of us. We're afraid. Because there are several times in that first chapter where God keeps saying, don't be afraid. Fear is not born of adversity. Fear is born of blessings we think we might lose. And God says to Joshua, be strong. My friends, do you see, this is not just a command. Oh, I got to be strong. I got to tip it up. I got to drink some muscle milk. I've got to lift weights. I got to walk 20 minutes a day. No, nobody said it. God is taking his strength and putting it on Joshua. That's the one the Israelites later on looked up and they said, my way, is, my way is hidden from my God. He doesn't seem to know what I'm going through. He doesn't seem to understand my plight, my situation. And Isaiah says, look up in the heavens. Who created all these things? He who created the heart starry host and calls them each by name and brings them out one by one, not any one of them is missing. And you're not missing either. You see, my friends, the God who strengthens, the God who gave Joshua the strength to be strong is the everlasting God, the creator of the end of the earth. He will not go tired or weary. And his understanding, no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. You see, my friends, God took his vision for Israel, placed it on Joshua, and then he said, Joshua, I'm going to equip you, and the equipment is going to be strength. Strength. I like that verse in Isaiah 40, 40, verse 31. I don't like the way the NIV translates it. I like better. I, I like the King James. The King James guys, I like that verse in King James better. They who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. And wait means I take my little gossamer thread 
and I wrap it around the anchor chain of God's strength. And as I wrap that anchor chain around God's strength, I am strong. You guys know what I'm talking about. You guys, any one of you could stand up this morning and tell the time when you were given strength by Almighty God Himself to do the vision that God put on your heart. Some of you are raising grandchildren. Some of you are watching people slip away into death. Some of you are dealing with your own stuff in your own lives. And yet at the same time, it's the Almighty God who gives you that strength rise up like an eagle. And so those, those down drafts and those buffering times, you know what an old rooster does? When there's a storm, an old rooster, he'll crow every morning when the sun's coming up. You guys are all city folk. You probably don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh wait, there's a couple here that live in the country. Sorry about that. Now here we go. The old rooster, what's he do? He sets in his house. The water drips on his head. Drip, 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 drip. He doesn't even have sense enough to get out of the drip. And he sits there. <laughs> and by the end of the day, he doesn't know. He's a lot ready to vote Democrats. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Forgive me. <laughs> and then he's sitting there. Oh, 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 Eagle Storm comes and the eagle jumps off his high perch and he just soars and floats on the updrafts. And while that rooster is all there soaked to the bone and hoping the farmer doesn't catch him and cut his head off and cook him, <laughs> the eagle is flying. They wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So, what does God do for the man with a vision? Joshua is an example, and Joshua is giving strength. Be strong. Then, Joshua is also given courage. Be courageous. There's a three B. The three B. Be courageous. Where are we now in my PowerPoint? Have more fun putting this together and to keep it around together. Uh, be courageous. Are you ready for a study in words, etymology? I can see you're all looking forward to it. <laughs> etymology. The word courage comes from an old French word meaning heart, core. Or rages, or courage, courage. So the Frenchman, the old, any French in here? No, probably not. They're all probably Scottish. But anyway, what, oh, any French? Anyway, here they are. And he says, courageous. And what it does, it means that it starts inside. It's an action of the heart. It's an action that causes us to be able to do the thing that we know God wants us to do. It's a jump start of the heart. I know people, they will, they'll train all the time. They're always exercising for, and they'll want to do a, a, a 5K walk or a 5K run, a 15K run. And what do they do? Why do they do that? No, they haven't fallen on their head. There's something in their heart. You and I probably know it better as a gut feeling, a gut action. They just got to do it. I know fishermen. They'll fish all day and all day. They'll go here and they'll go there. I do it. As a matter of fact, that's why I quit ice fishing. Uh, I went with a guy. He was all over that frozen lake, all over the place. 
And then he found a little tiny worm in a plant, and he was using that for bait. He caught one or two fish after about four hours of fishing, and he was excited as an ant with a grasshopper leg. <laughs> How did he do that? He had a heart for fishing. He had a heart for it. And he didn't quit. He hung in there. He had courage. And my friends, I believe that what happened when God said to Moses, be strong, be courageous, I believe God went right down with his strength and gave Joshua's heart a jump start. And Joshua got so fired up. We can do it, he said. We can do it. We can overcome. Woo! See, God's hand, God's strength, give him that jump start. Hey, hit that button. And it's going. Oh, God, give me courage. Jump start my heart for the things that are important to me. Jump start my heart. Oh, yes, yes. Now, my friends, where am I? There's a song, and, and uh, I just run across it. It's by Hillsong. You see, my friends, when we talk about courage, being a follower of Jesus Christ is not for the wuss. <laughs> Wusses better not sign up. Because here's some things going to happen. When you call me out upon the waters, call me out upon the waters, oceans deep, keep my eyes above the waves, where my feet may fail and fear surrounds me, where my feet and fear may fail. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger. Not working on this message, I was thinking of courage, and I thought of Judy Ross. My friends, this young lady had a good nursing <coughs> business in a Zealand hospital. A good nursing physician, a registered nurse in a Zealand hospital. It can't get a whole lot better than that. And she called, God called her. She had a vision to go, to, I think Ethiopia, wasn't it? Ethiopia somewhere? And she tells of opening her oven and finding a nest of mice. Now, you know, that would be just about enough for me to want to go home. <laughs> now, yeah, that's, that, that would clean it out and say, well, we'll make them a uh, cake tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but she worked with single moms, sometimes without water, sometimes without knowing the language, I, this is a single lady, Judy Ross, in a world that doesn't know anything but men and the power of men. That is courage. And that comes from Almighty God. What vision is God putting on your heart right now? What vision have you been dealing with for some time? A vision, and you're saying, you know, I, I, I think I ought to be doing that. I believe God wanted me to do that. What vision? And then I find God equipped him with strength, with courage, and then he said to him, be obedient. He equipped him with the word. <laughs> when I when I pastored in Bay City, 
I should tell you this, but I will. Okay. I knew of a lady that went to about three or four Bible studies during the week. She went through the Bible studies. Well, she went through the Bible studies like, well, I better not use that phrase. But she went through Bible studies like dirt through a goose. But none of it ever stuck. <laughs> Why is that? Somebody ought to tell people when they go to Bible studies, the Bible is there not to read, not to just argue about, not to discuss, but the Bible is there to obey. It's there to obey. And my friends, you know that you go back to Moses and those laws, health laws, those laws still apply today. Now, we're being politically correct, so there are times that we don't want to leave anybody out. We don't want to offend anybody. So we'll let people with, uh, uh, what, I better not name any disease, because you might be sitting here be offended. My friends, there were ways of curing diseases that go back to medical laws that Moses laid down. There's another law, but it's not written in the Holy Scriptures. It's called the law of gravity. That's one of God's laws. And God said, obey my word. The word is gravity. Now today, if, if uh, Wally walked out here on this roof and jumped off, we'd think, what's wrong with Wally? Did bowling game go low? <laughs> but we all have good sense enough to know that we've got to follow the law of gravity. Fall off out of a boat, the law of buoyancy. You will float for a while. Might wind up in Marysville, but you won't float. <laughs> you follow those laws that God has laid down. Water boils at a certain, what is it, 100, 100 degrees centigrade? <coughs> what, what is it? 212 centigrade? Oh, there. All right, thanks, Bob. Thanks, Barb. Okay. But that's the law. You obey that if you want to have something good. Or something to burn. And so, my friends, what the Bible is saying, what God is promising, is His Word. And when you obey that Word, you will have prosper. You will be prosperous and have good success. Now, don't go out and think you can buy that Ford Mustang because you're obeying the word, because you're living by the Ten Commandments. That's not necessarily what God has in mind here. If you can do it, tell me how you did so I can do the same. <laughs> but my friends, here's the point. Whenever the Israelites followed God's law, relied on God's strength, and took courage, they had good Success. They saw the vision out there. They saw a land flowing with milk and honey. That meant there was an overabundance of food. And these guys were all, you know, I might step right off and fall on my head. <laughs> but, but here is this over there in the wilderness. And they got all this stuff waiting for them, and all they got to do is cross that Jordan River, and all they got to do is follow God's plan and do it God's way. And my friends, I believe today that there are believers in Christ, if they simply followed God's plan and did it God's way, they might be out of debt, they might be having better success in their married life, or their in-laws, or their outlaws, or whatever kind of laws they're dealing with. 
Now, I know that's oversimplifying. I know it is. But I think it's a start. Now, what's the application? Where's the application? There's a lot of people that dream, and they never get any farther. His name was Scott. Scott used to stop in my office in his building. He saw me learning to play the guitar. Oh, he wanted to play the guitar. Oh, he was so happy about playing the guitar. Ding, 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 he wanted to play the guitar. And so I tried to help him a little bit, what little I knew, and told him different chords, on the, not chords, but strings, and what he could do. I think he even gave him a book. Every time he stopped in, I'd say to him, Scott, you playing that guitar? <laughs> I don't have time. <laughs> and I'm thinking, no, you weren't sitting here wasting my time. <laughs> You'd have time. You see, my friends, all Scott was doing was dreaming. A dream has to go from a dream to a vision. This is what God wants me to do. When I started out as a pastor, I believed that everyone could be one who is winning people to Christ. I took a verse out of, I think it's 2 Timothy 2.2. 2, teach reliable people who will teach reliable people. And by so doing, as you teach reliable people, and they teach reliable people, we can, ex we can win the whole world to Jesus Christ. At least we'd cover the world with the gospel. And so whatever church I pastored, the whole idea, the vision was, multiply churches. And you multiply them by each one teaching one. I looked that up a few weeks ago. I go through some junk in my office or in the basement of my clutter area. And I found that vision I had it written down. It's still my vision. Win someone to Christ. I still hope I win someone to Christ before I die. <coughs> I, hope I, do. I hope there's somebody out there that I can help find them to Jesus before I die. I hope I don't die very soon. But now here's the thing, my friends. God, each one of us has a vision. God gives us a vision. When we were created, he created us with the whole idea of a vision. There is some purpose, some plan that God has for you to do. Right now, I think it's to find my notes. I know the plans I have for you. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you. Plans to help you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Now, here's the thing. Someone says, you know, I would love to do God's will, but I've got this. But I've got that. Maybe that's God's will. Maybe God's going to work, have you work through that. Maybe that's, he's brought you to that situation, that place, because now you can do God's will through that thing. I believe that's very possible. You say, well, you know, I got this sick mother-in-law and I can't leave her. Well, maybe not. Maybe you can. Maybe that's where God wants you for that time. Someone says, I got this baby and I just, I don't know what I'm going to do. I just, maybe that's where God wants you to start. Maybe that's his vision for you, to raise up and teach a baby. God has the vision for your life. And then, my friends, that vision is found in John chapter 14. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Where is that place? It's repeated all the time in the, Old, in the New Testament. Paul says it all the time, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. That's where we are. We're in Christ, and the believer is in Christ. The psalmist thinking forward, he says, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord God Almighty. Can you imagine the beauty of Jesus? We can't see it. we got eyes that are all born over with the natural. But you know, if the natural is all taken away and all we could see was Jesus, can you imagine the beauty we would have? Can you imagine the beauty we would see? Oh. 
It must be wonderful where there is no sin abounding, where no sin is. If we, oh, and just take it all away. You know what? I have, I have people uh, that die in front of me, and they go with joy. They go with happiness. They go with excitement because now the veil is taken away. And they see what it really means to be in Christ. What does it mean to be in Christ? It means one final and complete sacrifice for sin. You don't have to sin and repent for the next 45 years of your life. It means a place of belonging, of security, of family relationship. Oh, my friend, there's a family relationship and the people of God. There's the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. The one I love is the place where the blood of Christ speaks. No condemnation. No condemnation. That's being God's vision for us. Grandpa Roth lived in Manton, or he lived on a farm in Manton. I think he might have had 40 acres. Grandpa Roth raised about eight, nine kids. His wife died in childbirth, so he had all these kids to take care of. Grandpa Ross was a poor man. Grandpa Ross tried to make a living. He tried to raise corn and potatoes on the ground where he couldn't raise your voice. In the winter, he went to the lumber camps to work to get some money. Grandpa Ross lived a poor life on poor land. And then one day, after Grandpa Rod died, that township, that county, said, hey, there's oil on this property. There's oil on this land. There's oil out there. There's gas. Woo! Oh, if only Grandpa Rod didn't know. But he didn't have the equipment. And he didn't have the knowledge. And so he never knew the richness that Shell Oil and anybody else had. Now, my friends, I, I believe, and I, I'm speaking even of myself, I believe that we are living on an oil field, a gold mine of the riches of Christ. And we don't seem to understand it or get the clue. We have a wealth of riches in Jesus Christ. We are children of God. We are the born again. We've been translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And I'm afraid oftentimes we accept the norm. We accept sin as the norm of life, and we can know no condemnation. We can be free from the power of sin. I don't mean you're never going to sin again. One day, Ben was talking to me. In fact, I'd read my Bible at the time, and I snapped at her. I still feel so bad about that. Here, read the Bible. Here, I just want to be a preacher. Read the Bible. My wife asked me a simple question, and I get calm about it. I've apologized a hundred times to the point now I think I'm worshiping myself by apologizing again. But my friends, sin does not reign. That, the Bible says you are no longer slaves to sin. You have the power to make choices. So what do we do in this service? Offer yourself to God. Just say, God, I have no, I can't promise you anything, but please fill my life with yourself. Be my vision. Be the person I need in my life. Do that. Just do those steps, whatever. And just from the very core of your being, tell God, make me a new person.
and don't be satisfied until you have that assurance in your very soul that Jesus Christ is your Savior. Let's stand and say it. Let's stand and say it. I think the ladies are going to say it. Right? Oh, wait, I'm 